Hello and welcome to today's Regulatory Transparency Project webinar. I'm Nate Kaz Merrick, Vice President and Director of RTP. As always, please note that all views and opinions uh, expressed on today's program are those of our guests. Uh, this afternoon, we've picked a timely topic. Agency guidance is an important aspect of every modern administration, and it's clear that the Biden administration uh, is no exception. I'm pleased to say that we've gathered an all-star group of experts for our discussion. Uh, to help us with this uh, conversation, we're happy to have an excellent moderator in uh, Daniel Flores. Daniel is the senior counsel for the House Committee on Oversight and Reform. Prior to his current position, he served as chief counsel for the House Subcommittee on Regulatory Reform, Commercial and Antitrust Law for the Committee on the Judiciary. And he has been the chief counsel for several other uh, important House committees. If you'd like to learn more about uh, Daniel's background and read the full bios of our other speakers today, you can visit our website, uh, regproject.org. That's R-E-G project.org. In a moment, I will uh, turn it over to Daniel. Once our panel has uh, completed their discussion, we'll have audience Q&A, so please think of the questions you'd like to ask them. Our Zoom audience members can ask a question by using the raised hand function, and Daniel will do his best to call on folks in the order uh, that you do so. Uh, and uh, please bring your tough uh, queries uh, for our answers, or for, to, to stump our experts today. With that, Daniel, uh, Bridget, Karen, and Paul, thank you very much for uh, being with us today. Uh, Daniel, the floor is yours. Daniel, I think you're on mute. My apologies, I thought it was off. Um, well, anyway, what, thanks again, Nate, and, and thank you everybody for joining us. We hope this is a, an informative and helpful forum for you. And I look forward to uh, getting questions from the audience. We hope uh, we trigger some, some useful questions for you. And we'd love to field them as we get to the end of the, the, the forum. But as Nathan, Nathan mentioned, guidance is a, is a highly important topic in the regulatory sphere. Over the past decade or so, increasing attention has been paid to it and to the role it serves. Uh, whether it has begun to supplant legally binding regulation as a governing tool, um, and what increases in transparency could help the public know better what views agencies have expressed in guidance documents, of which there are, there are thousands. Um, to place more parameters around the use of guidance, President Trump issued Executive Order 13891. President Biden rescinded that order upon taking office, and agencies are in the process of unwinding actions taken to implement the order. Today, we'd like to look at in depth uh, at the questions surrounding agency guidance. Um, what is guidance and how many different forms can it take? How is it issued? Why is it issued? And there are differing reasons for that. Uh, what are the key reasons to favor or disfavor current guidance practices? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, what did EO 13891 do? And what are the most common views for or against it? And lastly, what is the future of guidance reform following President Biden's rescission President, President Trump's uh, order. Uh, here to discuss this important topic for you are Paul Ray, Senior Advisor of Potomac Global Partners and former Administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs under President Trump. Uh, Karen Harnett, Executive Director of the National Federation of Independent Business Small Business Legal Center. And Bridget Dooling, Research Professor at the George Washington University's Regulatory Studies Center and former Deputy Chief, Senior Analyst and Attorney at the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, and also a former member of the agency review team for OMB for the Biden-Harris administration. I'm Daniel Flores, your moderator. As Nate mentioned, I currently serve as Senior Counsel on the Committee on Oversight and Reform at the House of Representatives. Uh, today, I'm here in my personal capacity, though, and my comments are my own and not made on behalf of the committee. Uh, with that introduction, let me turn it over to our panelists. And Paul, let's start with you. Great. Well, uh, thanks, Daniel. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to join you all here today. Uh, thank you for uh, for everyone who's on the line with us. And, uh, and Nate, thanks to you for your your leadership on the RTP initiative writ large. It's an honor to work with uh, work with all of you. Uh, in my very brief remarks today, I, I want to do three things. 
Uh, but first, I want to explain what guidance is and how it's currently used for those who may not know about it. Uh, second, I want to outline a few common uh, criticisms on the one hand and defenses on the other of current guidance practices. And third, uh, I'll make a brief case for establishing uh, an aisle crossing consensus around three principles that should inform OMB's recommendations for reforms of guidance practices as directed under President Biden's memo on modernizing regulatory review. Uh, when we were preparing Executive Order 13891 on good guidance practices, I and others were frequently asked by non-lawyers, well, what, what is guidance exactly anyway? And I, you know, I'm sure that we're joined mostly by lawyers today, but for uh, non-lawyers among us, as well as for lawyers who are not uh, specialists in administrative law, I'll briefly explain what guidance is. A good working definition of guidance is that it's an agency statement of policy or legal interpretation that lacks the force of law. Now, as the first part of that definition indicates, guidance can cover any sort of topic from the meaning of statutory or regulatory text to best practices for, reg for regulated industry or explanations of agency enforcement priorities. And, you know, I mean, basically anything else you can think of. What sets guidance apart then is not its subject matter, but its lack of legal force. Guidance cannot be enforced against regulated entities as statutes and regulations can. Now, to be clear, this is not to say that guidance never affects the rights and obligations of regulated parties, because governing case law affords deference to guidance in certain circumstances under uh, our and Seminole Rock. Guidance can, as a, as a practical matter, alter the meaning that courts give to particular regulatory provisions and hence uh, can alter the rights and obligations that those regulations confer. The key is that guidance, unlike a statute or a regulation, cannot create rights or obligations by virtue merely of its own command. That's what set, sets guidance apart. Because guidance lacks the force of law, it is not subject to the APA's notice and comment procedures, and it's generally not reviewable in court. These two facts together mean that guidance is much easier and less costly to issue than regulations, which have which uh, you know, regulations have to address comments and undergo an extensive process designed to strengthen them against legal challenge. And that's why agencies often rely on guidance where regulations would prove too costly or cumbersome to issue. How often, you ask? Well, we don't know how many guidance documents agencies have issued. Uh, we can gain some notion of the scope of guidance issuance by the fact that uh, as, of, uh, as of today, a single agency, the Department of Labor, uh, has some 8,500 guidance documents on its guidance portal. And that appears to be after the agency rescinded several thousand guidance documents in response to Executive Order 13891. And again, that's just one, uh, one agency. I'd like to shift now and outline uh, again, very, very briefly, some common criticisms and defenses of agency guidance practices as they exist today. Uh, I'm not going to be exhaustive uh, by any means, and I'm not even going to try to do justice to the particular criticisms or defenses that I mentioned. Uh, you know, hopefully we can explore uh, all of that later in the presentation. The idea here is basically to, to help situate uh, those who are unfamiliar with the debate about guidance uh, in, in some of the, the uh, issues that are discussed. Uh, probably the most common criticism of guidance is that it is rulemaking in disguise. The argument is that while guidance is technically non-binding, agencies issue it for a reason, and that's because parties comply with it. They comply because, as I mentioned earlier, uh, guidance may receive deference, but probably more because guidance constitutes a kind of safe harbor uh, against agency enforcement. Indeed, because uh, administrative investigations or enforcement can be as painful, maybe even more painful than any resulting penalties, parties who are in theory free to disregard uh, guidance are in practice bound to follow it to avoid investigations and enforcement. So guidance, so the theory goes, is therefore a way for agencies to get compliance without the costs and legal exposure of rulemaking. And as if that were not enough, critics point to several instances in which particular guidance had legal effect and therefore should have undergone a full regulatory process. In other words, agencies unlawfully designated regulations as guidance. These instances combined with the foregoing 
suggests that guidance is ripe for abuse. Now, defenders of guidance respond that private parties comply with guidance because they freely choose to do so. Indeed, agencies often issue guidance precisely because private parties want to know the agency's views on particular legal or policy questions. And so we shouldn't be too concerned about agency guidance when the regulated parties themselves seek it out. It's also hard to imagine how a government could operate if it had to go through full dress, notice and comment rulemaking, any time it wished to communicate about questions of legal interpretation policy. Guidance on this theory serves important efficiency interests. And it promotes transparency too, by creating an easy way for the government to inform the public of its own internal interpretations, enforcement priorities, etc. As for cases in which agencies have unlawfully designated regulations as guidance, defenders of guidance argue that these cases are the exceptions that prove the rule. Following agency guidance is purely optional, and the courts are there to ensure it stays that way. Now, as you may be able to tell from my summary, I think both the critics and the defenders of guidance make some important points, and hopefully we can explore those points later in the program. What I'd like to do now, though, is turn from differences to common ground. And in particular, I'd like to argue that regardless of one's views on the grounds of contention I've just outlined, there is a reasonable consensus around at least three basic points. I'll then suggest that three principles of reform for agency guidance practices follow logically from these consensus points, although the principles that I propose themselves uh, have not he uh, heretofore been the product of, uh, of consensus, but I think they should be. Uh, first, I think there's consensus that everyone should have equal access to agency guidance. A person's practical ability to locate and study guidance shouldn't depend on his or her retention of sophisticated legal counsel. And so agencies should do all they can to level the playing field between individuals and small businesses on the one hand and large companies on the other where access to guidance is concerned. The first principle of guidance reform that flows from this, uh, what I believe to be a consensus position, is that agencies should make guidance documents easy for unsophisticated members of the public to find. Uh, one way to do this was um, uh, found in Executive Order 13891, which Daniel mentioned, uh, and uh, that order um, directed agencies or, or departments within agencies to create guidance portals on which all currently effective guidance documents may be found in searchable format. At least some agencies I know continue to upload guidance to these portals uh, as, uh, as guidance is, is issued, notwithstanding the fact that President Biden has uh, revoked EO 13891. Uh, there may be other ways to address the need for equal access, but continued use of these guidance portals seems like a, a pretty good path forward to me. Um, second, there seems to be consensus that guidance has real world impacts. Critics and defenders of guidance may differ about the extent of compliance with guidance. Uh, they may differ about whether the efficacy of guidance, whatever it may be, is due to the free choice of regulated parties or to agency coercion. But I don't think it's really controversial that agencies issue guidance because it's worth their while to do so. That is to say, because a significant number of regulated parties do what guidance says. Now, one of the, one of the foundational principles of executive order 12866, which President Biden uh, has reaffirmed, is that agencies should account transparently for the costs and benefits of regulations. And given that guidance certainly also has impacts, I would offer as a second principle for guidance reform that agencies should attempt to estimate the costs and benefits of their guidance where appropriate. Now I say where appropriate because there are real challenges to understanding the impacts of guidance. And where those challenges simply cannot be overcome, then an agency, of course, can't tell us what the impacts of its guidance are. The agency can't do the impossible. But in cases where impacts can be assessed, they should be. Executive Order 13891 pursued this goal by applying the EO 12866 cost benefit analysis framework to guidance. Now there are certainly other ways to pursue that goal, uh, the important thing, to my mind, is that agencies should attempt to disclose to the public the costs and benefits of their guidance. The third point, uh, the third consensus point, is 
I think there's agreement that at least some guidance implicates interagency equities. So let's take as an example OSHA's January guidance on COVID safety in the workplace, which was updated um, a few days ago, sometime this month. Uh, that guidance makes recommendations for workplaces in industries that are regulated by a number of agencies, such as the Departments of Transportation, Agriculture, Education, and name others, uh, to name a few. Um, those departments may well have had information that's very useful to OSHA in making the guidance as effective and efficient as possible. And guidance like this therefore implicates interagency equities just as surely as regulations of a similar nature do. A third principle of guidance reform then would be that guidance should be subject to interagency coordination as needed. Now, typically, of course, interagency coordination means OIRA review, and that's the approach that EO 13891 took, although there may be other ways to achieve this objective. So these three principles, uh, equal access, assessment of impacts, and inter interagency coordination should be taken into account in any future guidance reform efforts, including those contemplated by the Modernizing Regulatory Review Memo. So uh, those are the three points that I wanted to address. And uh, with that, I will turn things back over to uh, back over to Daniel. Thanks, Paul, for those great comments. And let me turn now to Kieran. Hi, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Paul. And I appreciate everyone spending their Friday afternoon with us um, on this topic. Um, so I, as Daniel mentioned, run um, the National Federation of Independent Business Small Business Legal Center. And um, as Paul alluded to, small business owners have a particular interest in agency guidance. Um, the small business owners that I represent and we target our work for, on average, have five or 10 employees or, or fewer. So they really are Main Street America. They're your local dry cleaner, your local little pub, your, um, you know, uh, specialty gift shop, you know, all of those bakery. Those are the types of folks that I'm thinking about when I'm looking at this issue. And for them, we have learned over decades of research and surveys and anecdotal evidence, all pointing to one thing, which is regulatory burdens for small business owners are much higher than they are for, you know, our Fortune 100 companies in, in the uh, country, which is not surprising because it's the small business owner. It is the person that opened that dry cleaner that is actually having to learn about what regulations exist and familiarize him or herself with it and come into compliance. More complicated those regulations are, the more likely they are to hire an outside consultant. But when you're netting as little as, you know, um, $100,000 uh, a year, which many small business owners actually that is, they want the freedom. That's why they started their business, but they're not sitting on a bunch of cash. They are drawing um, a, a good salary, but not an ex extraordinary salary in many instances. So that's money that they're going to have to pay out of their pocket to get that um, information on the regulatory process. So with all that to say, you know, I've done administrative law for decades now and, you know, know easily how to look at the federal register and see what rules are out there. Uh, small business owners typically are going to hear this from their colleagues in the same industry, their small industry trade group, bigger um, associations, business associations of which they're affiliated like NFIB or the chamber. Um, but then, but that's where the regulations where you're doing notice and comment. Guidance documents, it really is the savvy Main Street small business owner that's even going to really know these exist and that's going to be probably because they tripped on it they tripped over it they found out maybe through an inspector maybe through um, a call to one of their business organizations. Um, and so I wanted to spend some time on that because I wanted people to understand that I really I liked all of Paul's points there his principles, but the access to guidance is, is a huge one because understanding what their legal obligations are in this day and age is very, very hard for the average small business owner because there's so many legal obligations they need to be aware of. 
Now, that makes it sound like I think, you know, I, I do have a healthy skepticism for guidance. I will say that because I do think notice and comment is very important as often and um, as that can be done because that's how you prevent unintended consequences and regulation. But I will also say that, you know, we answer um, in addition, addition to the litigation that I do at my job uh, for small business on behalf of them, we also answer literally thousands of small business owner calls across for, through the, throughout the year on everything from, you know, OSHA regulation to wage an hour to, um, you know, transportation issues, EPA issues, you name it. And um, what we have seen after doing this for two decades now is there are some examples out there of guidance that truly is guidance and extremely helpful. And examples of that I would point to you are Department of Labor, which is a big agency in any small business owner's life, because if you've got an employee, you need to care about what they're saying, has fantastic things called these fact sheets that are one to two pagers. They'll go through everything from who's in it, uh, who's, uh, how to calculate um, hours to hours worked to who's an executive um, exempt employee versus who's not. Um, and they do it by plain English. It's there. You look at them. They're very easy to read. You do not have to be an attorney to understand them. They often provide multiple examples of what they're talking about, which examples are huge for a small business owner, just trying to figure out what the bottom line is that he or she needs to do to stay in compliance with the law. And um, so those, those are an example of an excellent resource. With coming off the pandemic, another time we saw guidance as extremely critical was as the Small Business Administration and the Treasury Department were putting forward the parameters of how to participate in um, the Payment Protection Program loan, uh, loan program. And that is what was a lifeline for many small business owners, I, I would say a majority of them across the country throughout COVID. And it allowed them to get a loan and um, stay in business since the government had basically told them they couldn't have their business open and then also get that loan forgiven. And there were so many details surrounding that, but in, and you would it would have just been impossible to do that all through notice and comment answering the types of questions that were coming up daily. And SBA and Treasury, to their credit, churned out guidance almost daily, especially at the beginning of the program, that really was quite useful and helped small business owners understand, helped banks that were lending to them understand what their obligations were, what was going to happen. And so those are two examples, I think, of where guidance can be very, very useful. Um, I think the big concern I have for um, guidance, other than just the access point, because small business owners, like I said, you know, are not trolling the Federal Register. They don't have lobbyists in D.C. They, they just don't know all these things that are always happening as they're happening. Um, but I would say my, my bigger concern is that I have encountered over my career instances um, where um, those that are tasked with enforcing the laws for an agency, a field investigator, for example, really is making that guidance, in their mind, it's legally binding. Let's just put it that way. And a small business owner may not know, and in many times doesn't know, that they can push back on that. Um, assertion. And so that is another thing is how it's used by the agency and how agency staff is trained when dealing with the, the different guidances that they are, uh, they have developed for that agency. Um, and with that, um, that's my presentation. I'll turn it over to Bridget. Thanks, Karen. Bridget, take it away. All right. Thank you both for teeing up so many good issues for us today. Um, so thanks so much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you. I'm a research professor at the GW Regulatory Studies Center, and I came here after over 10 years 
on the career staff at the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. As Daniel mentioned, I served on the Biden-Harris transition team, but just to be clear, I don't speak for the transition or the administration, and I'm here today representing my own views with gratitude to FedSoc for inviting me today. So I had already left the career staff at OIRA when EO13891 was issued. That's the guidance executive order that uh, Paul introduced at the top. Uh, so my comments are based on basically what I could observe from the outside. Now, the EO directed agencies, among other things, to stand up centralized websites to house guidance and also to issue rules governing the issuance of guidance documents, which sounds pretty reasonable, right? Well, it's really the details that matter on this one. Um, I'll focus my remarks on why I think the EO probably had to go but why that doesn't mean that this is the end for the federal executive branch policymaking on guidance. So I'll set the websites aside because I think they're a good idea. I agree with Paul unequivocally on that point. Um, helping the public locate guidance that is in effect is just an absolute no brainer to me. Uh, the rules that were required by the EO on the other hand turned out to be a bit much. Now I'm all for good process. I think it's important that lots of folks in an agency and across the executive branch have eyes on a document before it goes out the door. I support the use of public comment periods for guidance when appropriate, as well as a wire review and cost benefit analysis and distributional analysis of guidance documents. These guidance rules, however, created three types of concerns that ultimately, I think, led to their demise. So first is the scope. As we've discussed, guidance is such a broad concept covering so many types of agency behavior that distilling it down to one word, guidance, flattens out a whole lot of nuance here. The core challenge is that in many contexts, guidance, as has been mentioned before today, is generally quite sought after by stakeholders and the, regulator, the regulated community. And it's really hard to categorically separate good guidance from bad guidance uh, you know, in advance. So it makes it really hard to write good policy covering guidance. And this has been a challenge for many administrations, not just the most recent two. Um, so second, uh, the restrictiveness, I think, is one of the reasons why this the, the executive order 13891 was, was pulled down. I think the core challenge for issuing rules that apply to guidance builds on that last point, which is that in many cases, guidance is requested by the public. And taken together, the rules apply additional control to the issue of guidance. And even if you think that's a good thing, you have to admit that it adds time and complexity to the internal development process. I mean, indeed, in some ways, that is the point to actually allow for better and um, higher quality internal review. But the rules also introduce new choke points. So for example, the Department of Education's rules required that the general counsel sign off on all guidance documents, all of them. And I'm someone who really likes good process, but too much process is just no longer a good thing. So the third thing I'd raise is the timing of these changes. The EO was issued in October, 2019, and that's more than a year before the presidential election. Most agencies that did rules in response to the EO published them in final form at some point in the second half of 2020, including many after the election. Now, I take no issue with that as an administration runs up through an inauguration day and rulemaking takes time. So it's reasonable that an EO issued in, you know, towards the end of 2019 would have to be implemented over the course of 2020. But as a practical matter, this meant that many of the restrictions these rules applied to a relatively short amount, sorry, that many of the restrictions that of these rules applied to a relatively short amount of time in the Trump administration, with at least one of the rules going into effect only once the Biden administration had begun. So Camille Chambers, who's a fabulous legal intern at, the, at our center, the Regulatory Study Center, will map this timeline out in a commentary coming out soon. So we'll have something soon for you in the coming weeks that just gives you a, a nice visual for how these rules went into effect. Um, but this timing may have just doomed the whole enterprise. I'm doing some research now on the idea of what it takes um, for new policy ideas to become institutionalized. And without getting too deeply into it, let me just say that issuing an EO is generally not enough. Because EOs are issued with a stroke of a pen, they just don't guarantee long-term results because they can be revoked with a stroke of a pen. 
And all of this was happening at a time when the incoming administration was ready to hit the ground running with a whole host of actions to respond to the pandemic, the economic crisis, racial equity, climate, and more. And a philosophy that I don't think it'll surprise anyone to say supports a stronger role for the federal government in responding to issues like these. Now, the new guidance rules included waivers and other ways to respond to emergencies, but that wouldn't cover everything. And even that process of seeking waivers does create additional process within an agency. So in sum, asking the administration to be bound to a series of discretionary procedural and controls imposed by the prior administration and imposed in just enough time to apply mostly to the incoming team, well, it probably just wasn't gonna work. But I suspect this isn't the last that we'll see of guidance policy. The Presidential Memorandum on Modernizing Regulatory Review nods in this direction. Issued on the same day that EO 13891 was revoked, it calls on OIRA to determine an appropriate approach with respect to the review of guidance documents. And in guidance issued by OMB in April 2021, Acting Director Shalanda Young wrote about OIRA's continuing coordination of guidance documents related to COVID-19, a process that began in the Trump administration. I took that as a good sign that OIRA review was helping the new administration achieve its objectives and that guidance is still very much in scope. So to wrap up, the main point I'd make is that while guidance is a long running issue for the reasons that Paul and Karen have ably teed up, and it definitely needs ongoing attention. I'm comfortable that revoking 13891 was for the best on balance for now. Back to you, Daniel. Thank you, Bridget. Um, terrific comments from our panelists. I hope uh, the audience finds them to be. And uh, let me just suggest we're just past the half hour mark. I'd like to leave a healthy 20 minutes for audience questions. We already have a couple that have come in and I'm sure we're gonna have some good responses to them. So. I'd like to see if we could take, you know, 10 minutes at the most for some cross panel discussion and then get into the audience question. I'm wondering, you know, if, if you all might agree, if it makes sense to start the cross panel discussion with your thoughts about Paul's uh, three points of proposed consensus and proposed principles. And to what degree do you think there really is consensus uh, around those in government, uh, both in the executive branch and in Congress and in the stakeholder community and elsewhere? Anybody should feel free to jump in and start the discussion. I'm happy to start. I, I mean, I really, I, I, I definitely agree with each of the principles. Um, I think um, uh, that Paul was, I, I also feel like what Paul was advocating is not um, uh, over the top as in, you know, it's as it's possible on cost benefit because not all guidances are the same. And, you know, there are some that really do, um, and I think the Trump administration was trying to get at this as previous administrations have too. I mean, the bigger ones that are gonna have a broader impact, um, I, I definitely think if there's ability to figure out cost benefit, that's always a good thing because whether it's guidance or regulation, I do believe that, you know, you're going to, by the more you can do on that um, assessment, the less likely you are to have as many unintended consequences. I don't know that you'll ever alleviate them completely, but I do think that can really handle, that can really help with that problem. I am happy to hear that everybody on this panel um, agrees that it would, it's good to have easy access to these documents, especially in the day when we've got such a you know, strong internet platform and Google and all sorts of ways to find these. Um, uh, you know, remarkably, there are still a few out there that are against it, but I, I would like to think that there is broad consensus there. Um, and I also um, am a big proponent of the work that Paul and Bridget did at, at OIRA. I just think OIRA is invaluable. And again, it doesn't need to be for every guidance document, but when you've got some that are really dealing with big pack patches of a regulatory scheme that's already complicated and just trying to take it down a little bit more and put some more clarity there, I think that it is it is it is better to have more eyes on it. And I would I would advocate that. So I personally was in favor of those three principles. 
Please yeah, and I'll just I'll just build on that to say, you know, I, I, I agree. I think my only quibble would be that I would probably broaden the second analytical point to include more than just benefit cost analysis. I'd probably consider other forms of analysis too, but I think I would consider that a friendly amendment <laughs> on Paul's three. I will let him confirm. Um, but in general, I mean, equal access to guidance is just a no brainer. That's absolutely something that we should be striving for. Um, and I, I agree wholeheartedly with the idea that you know guidance has real world impact. And in fact, that's why agencies issue it. And that's why folks uh, sometimes clamor for it on the outside because they, they really need to know the answers to these questions. And then on the interagency equity question is pretty straightforward to me too. I mean, you'd rather work out disconnects within the federal government before something goes live and just creates confusion out on the street. So I think that's right. I mean, I, I think there's definitely people on the left who, were, who are more skeptical of the role of a wire review, skeptical of the, of the role of tools like cost benefit analysis. And so um, I just don't happen to be one of them. I mean, I, I tend to think benefit cost analysis is a yes and that we should you know, do it as well as doing other forms of analysis all to the goal of helping inform the decisions that policymakers are making in the executive branch. Um, also, I think OIRA plays a pivotal role in that interagency review. So uh, I know Paul nodded to the idea that another entity could probably pull it off. Uh, you know, I think it would have to be something new. I'm not aware of another entity in the executive branch that could do as good a job as OIRA does with interagency review. Thanks, Bridget. Paul, any, any responsive thoughts? Yeah, no, I. I uh... Thank you both. Uh, I, I agree with everything that you all just said. And uh, Richard, to your point, yes, I uh, certainly would, would support uh, extending the impact analysis to more than cost and benefits, you know, certainly distributional analysis. I'd love to see for, for quite significant guidance documents, uh, alternatives assessed as well uh, where, it's, where it's feasible. So yes, I think that's, I think that's exactly right. Thank you. Um, let me then, no, we, we have about five minutes till when I wanted to start the audience questions. So let me ask a question of my own, get some discussion on, and then let's turn to the audience questions. My, my question is about where we are at this moment in time. You know, I'd like to ask all of our panel members to, to offer some thoughts on, on their views on the specific importance of guidance, guidance transparency, and guidance reform as we all emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Karen, since this is a key issue for small businesses trying to recover, let me ask you to start and then for Bridget and Paul to chime in. Um, I think um, we did get, again, some really good lessons learned um, through COVID. Again, how uh, 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 guidance can be a great tool to get quick and understandable information out to the regulatory regulated community so that was huge um i do think that um as far as where we are in this time um i, I don't know I, I feel like these regulatory issues are so tricky on the hill in particular i do think that a lot of what paul's advocating for um you know we're in agreement and it, the devil's in the details to some just degree but even on the access point, unfortunately, I just don't even know if we can get there right now, just because I feel like it's just hard to get anything in this space done because everybody's too skeptical of the other side. But I'm, I mean, that's just my take based on what I've seen, but I'm anxious to hear what others say as far as, you know, where we are and got into what might happen in the future. Yeah. Bridget, Paul, any thoughts? Yeah, I would add that, I mean, so what I've been just paying attention to is the way, you know, the handoff between the two administrations, um, you know, we're, we're only about, what, six months into this administration. And so, you know, that initial handoff was something that we were working very hard on in the transition to figure out how to make sure that, you know, that um, policy review and responsiveness to emerging issues, particularly related to the pandemic, were seamless and that you know the incoming team had what they needed to hit the ground running and and get done what they needed to do. And so when I saw that memo come out from um, the acting director in April signaling that there is there continues to be a very robust um, process for handling, expediting, but still reviewing COVID related materials, including guidance. I, I was really encouraged by that because it just shows me that what I suspected was happening on the inside is indeed happening and that the 
that the coordinated review is is continues to be robust. Great, that's very good to know. Um, first audience question is from Greg. He says, hi, thanks. And what have or are we learning about these issues from litigation on them? And what are the major points in case law and pending cases? So anybody want to take a whack at that? Bridget, Paul, perhaps since you're the lawyers, we should start with one of you. I know I should have an answer on this. I actually don't. I haven't looked at the case law on, on uh, guidance in a while. Paul, do you have anything? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, um, for folks interested in, in reading um, on the topic, you know, I think uh, you could start with uh, with Perez, right, uh, which talks about interpretive rules uh, uh, under 5 U.S.C. 553. Obviously, there's a lot of guidance documents that are not interpretive rules, uh, but um, but some that are, and so I think that's a that's a fine place to start. Um, you could also you could also read Alina. It's probably the most recent. Uh, uh, Supreme Court decision that's relevant to the to the guidance question. Um, you know, m one of my personal favorites uh, of, of this genre is uh, is Appalachian Power. It's a DC Circuit opinion from 2000, uh, and uh, basically discusses in some detail um, uh, the way guidance interacts with the enforcement processes of, of agencies. Uh, and and actually, that's a Appalachian Power is an instance in which a uh, guidance document was found to, uh, the court found that it ought to have gone through the, the regulatory process uh, because it wasn't, it did in fact have the force of law. So um, those are a few, uh, a few of the more salient cases uh, on, on the topic. Thanks, you know, one, one term that comes to my mind from this area of case law is the term non-rule rule. You know, a lot of the DC circuit case law and such, clusters around that kind of common sense handle for talking about, well, when something's in guidance, but is really a rule, what ought we to do with it? As Paul mentioned, the, the solution is to require it to go through notice and comment uh, if it's a non-rule rule. Um, great question. Uh, Bridget, do you wanna add anything on that or should we move on to the next one? Let's move on. Okay, next is from Jordan uh, who asked, you know, recently I've seen a phenomena where agencies will issue FAQs frequently answered questions documents that have the force of regulations without going through the normal notice and comment period. For example, SBA's PPP program initially had a small IFR information uh, request, but a large uh, FAQ that would make significant changes to who was eligible for the loans. Have you seen the same? Is there any, are there any rules regarding FAQs going around the traditional public rulemaking process? Karen, this is a topic you alluded to in your comments. So let me ask you to kick this off. Yeah, I mean, and so that is some of the, well, and on that, that PPP was just a mess, quite frankly, just as far as trying to get it done um, quickly and get people information they needed. So I kind of view that one as more of a one off. Um, I I do think um, we, we did see not just at the federal level, but at the state level, FAQs that really did kind of have, I mean, businesses felt like they definitely had to follow them let's just put it that way and despite the fact that guidance isn't legally binding especially when it came to like the osha the cdc guidance for how to keep your workplace safe and those types of things and i just think we have to be really careful on that because um uh you know i have seen over my years where again an, an inspector will you know basically make the business owner think that if they don't do this they could get cited that what what is required in an FAQ or a guidance document is um, required by law and um, if a small business owner doesn't push back on that and just does it you know they're giving up their rights in that instance and so um, I just think the agencies have to be very careful very careful on how they train and again um, I just think guidance really should be helping regulatory the regulated community not imposing more um, burdens on them or more legal or or making it seem like they have more legal obligations than they otherwise would have. I, I think that is that is to me what true good guidance is is when it's just helping clarify what a regulation means and how to how what it means in real life. Thanks. Uh, Paul, Bridget, either of you want to add some comments? Yeah, I'd love to add just that I think it's a great question because 
um, I alluded earlier to the idea that what counts as guidance is such, it's just such a capacious concept, guidance. And like FAQs are guidance. Press releases can be guidance. Speeches can be guidance. You know, <laughs> Letters can be guidance. So there are so many forms of guidance out there. And so what, what we've been talking about this whole panel, basically FAQs are in scope. And the question is, you know, what type of um, policies and processes should the government have that govern the, the development and issuance of those guidance, the review of those guidance, how transparent those guidance documents are, and the limits of what can go in them, right? So if, if they really are restricting access to a program, you know, based on the content of an FAQ, there's probably some legal issues wrap, wrapped up in that too. So mostly just to validate the instinct of the commenter, which is that, you know, FAQs, FAQs are definitely guidance, and so they're in scope for what we've been talking about today. Paul? Nope, nothing bad. Okay, let's do the next question then. This is a question in from Jeffrey. And he asks, what about the brand memo at the Department of Justice and its incorporation into the US Attorney's Manual? It's a reference to a memo issued by former Associate Attorney General Rachel Brand on guidance in the enforcement context. And he asks whether there are similar restrictions on the enforcement of guidance adopted by agencies under the Trump administration, uh, for example, uh, whether the Department of Health and Human Services adopted a similar policy. Um, Paul, you want to take a whack at that? Yeah, sure. So uh, that was a focus of effort uh, in, in the Trump administration. There's an executive order 13892, uh, which was a companion executive order to uh, 13891, which we've discussed at some length today, uh, that among other provisions forbade agencies from uh, from imposing a penalty on the basis only of guidance, uh, the agency had to uh, cite and prove a violation also of the underlying statute or regulation. Uh, and then that principle was reiterated in Executive Order 13924, Section 6, uh, from uh, the middle of 2020. So uh, that absolutely was uh, was a focus of effort. You know, obviously, those have been uh, those have been rescinded. You know, um, I. You know, I, I suppose we could put together another list of, uh, of consensus positions on the use of guidance and enforcement. I, I suspect there's a, a similar uh, consensus that uh, that guidance standing alone shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be used to, to show a violation that that it has to be uh, shown uh, on the terms of of a statute or regulation. Uh, but uh, I could be I could be wrong about that. Bridget, Karen, any further thoughts on this question? Um, I actually just looked up the DOJ reg agenda entry for the guidance document rule revocation. And just to give a you know small update that they've at least got it scheduled for revocation in June of this year. But as we know, that's that's now. So <laughs> I don't know if we'll see it this month. That's what they said in the agenda. Um, you know, the agenda is non-binding, so it's hard to say. Uh, but, you know, um, it's possible that that uh, the revocation of that rule is is tangled up in the question that the that the questioner is asking here in the chat. Gotcha, Karen. I'm good. I, I don't have anything further. Okay, we have a, another couple of questions. Uh, I would encourage any audience members out there thinking of one to go ahead and send it in. Um, we have a question from Ruben, who says, "I assume that a majority of this guidance conversation focuses on rulemaking. I suppose that's issues related to to rules, to rule rulemaking." But should agencies consider separate guidance policies for adjudication to the extent that agencies have adjudicatory divisions? Um, uh, Karen, any thoughts on that? Or anybody else want to chime in? I actually have not thought about this at all. <laughs> so I'd be curious if somebody else has any thoughts on this one. Yeah, I can uh, jump in on that. So uh, I do think that it's important for agencies to address the procedures uh, and standards that will be applied in adjudication enforcement. Um, I would rather see them do it in uh, in regulations rather than in guidance documents because I, I think that imparts greater certainty uh, to the public that has to uh, operate and, and live under the uh, adjudicatory standards and procedures at issue. So I uh, I would rather see it done done that way where uh, where that's possible. Bridget, any thoughts? 
I was going to say something along those same lines um, that certainly adjudicatory bodies have a need to issue guidance and and parties, you know, coming before those bodies have have a need to receive guidance. And so I think the question that Paul raises is a good one is the nature of the guidance that's being given, you know, appropriate for mere guidance, or is it more of a rule and, and that's probably enough to fill a whole other webinar on the distinction between <laughs> uh, guidance and rules. Yep, may well be. Um, next question is from Susan. Uh, she is uh, a law professor or professor of public affairs and political science. She's asking uh, on Tuesday, uh, June 22nd, the IBM Center for the Business of Government will be releasing a paper of hers called Guidance on Regulatory Guidance, What the Government Needs to Know and Do to Engage the Public. It makes recommendations to increase the transparency and, guide and public engagement of guidance development it also provides new quantitative analysis on FDA guidance making and provides an implementation analysis of the former Trump order. She wants to let uh, everybody in the group know and those in the audience, uh, and thanks for the panel, but I wanna ask a follow-up question on this, which is uh, regarding public involvement in the development of guidance. You know, often guidance comes in uh, on a, a one-off basis from a company that has a particular issue, they're seeking guidance so they can manage it um, and get that kind of safe harbor that, that Paul mentioned earlier. But sometimes the agency wants to do something that's more comprehensive, but sub-regulatory and guidance is the path it wants to take. Um, any thoughts from anyone on, on the right way to approach public engagement in the formulation of, of that kind of guidance? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, speak, uh, I'll speak to that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm interested to, to read this uh, the study that Susan mentions, uh, in particular, since it addresses uh, FDA guidance. FDA probably has the most uh, robust and articulated uh, guidance uh, set of guidance procedures in the federal government. Uh, and, and they had uh, regulations on point uh, before Executive Order 13891. Uh, so, um, you know, I think. Um, FDA's approach on guidance uh, with respect to public engagement is a, is a pretty good one. Uh, so FDA uh, will typically issue a guidance document for public comment in draft form, just like it would for regulation, and then, uh, and then it will uh, often respond to the comments uh, received. And you know, that's the kind of procedure that EO 13891 contemplated for significant guidance. So um, yeah, I, th I think that's a good, uh, that's a good approach. I think that can be can be very important. You know, um, uh, I I don't see a reason to distinguish between regulations and guidance with respect to uh, to the important role the public comment uh, should should play. Karen Bridget, you know, I just have to comment. Um, it is so funny that to me, as a former FDA lawyer, that FDA is now a good example on how to do guidance right because, quite frankly, they used to be the poster child, in my opinion, for how to do it wrong. I mean, Bridget had mentioned, you know, a speech could be guidance. I remember working at the law firm and the speech was like guidance. You had to cover every speech. You had to cover these things called pink sheets. I mean, I just would think about my little small business owners, if they were doing anything in the space, what, how they would even know to do any of this. So um, they definitely got a hold of the problem and handled it with, uh, uh, very well. And so it's, it's funny now to see that they really are an example for the others. Yeah. And I'm, I'm thrilled to know that the great Susan Yaki is studying this. We'll be really excited to see her report next week. And I love the choice of FDA as a, as a unit of analysis here, because as folks have mentioned, they have these rules that Congress required them to write about how they, they issue guidance. And it includes a comment period for people to weigh in on the content and guidance. Um, and that's an interesting example because I, I recall when the when executive order well, 13891 was issued in other sectors that aren't accustomed to having guidance go through draft form, it was quite shocking, the idea that, that guidance documents would be put out for public comment. Well, FDA has been doing it for quite some time and they, they issue plenty of guidance. On the other hand, I think there's folks in the regulated community at FDA and maybe even within FDA itself who would say that they have lots more guidance they'd like to get out to people. And so you know, the, it, there's just this tension here between additional procedure and you know, how, um, how much guidance actually ends up emerging from an agency. So just to reinforce the point that I think I think studying FDA is a is a great idea, and I look forward to seeing what uh, Professor Yaki 
finds, um, because I think that's a perfect example of the types of tensions that exist in this space. Great. Um, at this point, I guess I'm informed there are a couple of folks with their hands up. Uh, I don't see uh, the individuals on my screen. So let me ask uh, Nate or one of his colleagues if they can uh, open the mics and call on there. Oh, I'm seeing now is Justin and Barbara. So if either, want, either of you want your mic open so you can articulate your question, please, uh, please let us know. Well, I think I, I'm unmuted now. So if you can hear me, I'll go ahead. This is Justin Pearson. We can Fantastic. So um, I'm a lawyer at the Institute for Justice. For those of you who don't know IJ's work, uh, I spend most of my time uh, providing pro bono representation to small business owners challenging uh, unconstitutional and anti-competitive regulations. And one of the issues that keeps popping up on my cases is giant businesses will intervene or at the very least write amicus briefs opposing our lawsuits because they were the ones that pushed for the law. And so I'm very aware of the fact that many of the, these regulations are, are swords um, pushed for by giant businesses to hurt smaller businesses. And so I'm wondering whether the panelists, and by the way, thank you all, this has been great, I've enjoyed it. But I'm, I'm wondering whether any of the panelists are concerned that the guidance process exacerbates this problem of giant businesses using regulations as swords against their smaller competitors? A great question, uh, Karen. Well, I think it can. I mean, that's, again, that's why I think we also need to get a better definition of what we consider to be guidance. I mean, again, I am very strong on, I think guidance should be clarifying um, and making it very easy to understand for the non-lawyer what you're, what, the regulation is telling you what to do, using examples, things like that. I'm confident that others have a much broader interpretation of guidance, but I do think that that is what you see. I mean, honestly, again, for the small business owner, they're the ones trying to navigate this. And that is why uh, big businesses with, you know, their team of attorneys and HR and compliance, I mean, they really have the advantage. And so we have seen over the years that they will use regulation as a sword to, you know, keep competition out. So that is very much a concern that we have. We have. Okay, we have four minutes left. We have one more person in the queue, Barbara, Paul, uh, Bridget, if either of you have a quick comment on, uh, on Justin's point, let's let's hear it. And if not, let's move on to Barbara. Yeah, just a quick response. I mean, I think that the point that the caller raises is one that is met at least somewhat by uh, Paul's notion of having analytical requirements that attach to guidance documents, because that's part of what we're trying to assess when we use those analytical tools is sort of what's the effect of this guidance document going to be intended and otherwise, right? If we look, if we try to do our best to peer into the future and think about how this guidance is going to affect operations on the ground, what can we reasonably expect? And so, um, although procedures like that do slow the issuance of, issuance of guidance, they also help the government have a better sense of what it is that what it, what the consequences of their actions will be um, along the lines of, of what the caller suggested. Paul, any thoughts? Nope, couldn't have said it better. Okay, super. Um, let's then go to Barbara. Barbara, is your mic open? Okay, perhaps we're having a technical problem. Um, let me let me ask. We've just got a, three minutes left. Let me ask you. While we're trying to get Barbara up. Uh, if the three of you would like to offer any quick closing comments to to highlight any any one thing or two before we break. And Barbara, if you come on, we'll we'll, we'll break for you when you come in. Bridget, you want to start this one? Sure. Um, so grateful for the opportunity to to talk about these issues today. I want to. Um, let you know that we'll have a little bit more coming out uh, in the next week or maybe two um, to describe how these rules are being revoked in practice. Um, there's sort of this interesting asymmetry um, that only 31, if my count is right, and Camille will have the proper number in her in her report when she issues it, um, 31 agencies issued these rules um, coming out of EO 13891, and we're somewhere around 17 rules having been revoked at this point. So it's sort of interesting to look at which agencies didn't implement guidance rules um, on the front end, and then also sort of comparing of those agencies that uh, you know are in the middle of trying to revoke them, you know, where they are 
in the process. And I, I see Wayne uh, Cruz on the participant list here too. He's got a great tracker that covers the websites. Um, so if you're curious about the status of agency websites, I think um, Wayne is covering that over at CEI. So that could be another resource for you too. Great. Let me ask uh, Paul and Karen to bear with us. We have two more hands up now. We have Justin, whom I, I'm sorry, we have uh, Barbara, who may have come on the mic now, and then we have Taboa. Do we have time, Nate? Okay. Yes, Barbara, we squeeze it in if, if Barbara is available. Okay, let's start with Taboa while we wait for Barbara. Looks like it's still not working. Um, Paul, would you like to add, to add a closing comment? Yeah, sure. So I, what I would say is, um, I, I think it's uh, it's hopeful that uh, it's, it's not like there is consensus on on the three points that we've been talking about. And uh, you know, I um, you know, given that OMB has been directed to propose uh, procedures uh, for addressing. Uh, Guidance document and any uh, guidance documents and any immediate reforms to those guidance documents uh, in uh, under modernizing regulatory review. You know, I, I hope that um, that OMB's proposals are are robust, and uh, you know, uh, I, I would certainly welcome uh, uh, proposals from OMB that could then be implemented uh, in a you know in a timely manner and and perhaps uh, by the agencies and, and perhaps could be the the nucleus of a kind of uh, consensus approach that would uh, that would last across administrations you know uh, a la 12866 I think it could be a real service to uh, a real service to regulated parties in the country okay Karen I'd like to say you know thank you for the opportunity and I do think this is an important issue I mean guidance is our regulatory state has gotten so big and guidance is now very big part of it. And I think um, making sure that all of the regulated community knows what's out there. Um, and also, um, you know, uh, there's really a lot of, you know, good work done um, interagency review, uh, cost benefit and other reviews prior to issuing guidance. I think we're there. I think that needs to happen. And I'm glad to hear that um, on the fundamental points, there seems to be agreement. Okay, fantastic. We're, we're still not uh, with Barbara to vote with us. So let me ask uh, Nate if he would like to take it back. Yes, uh, I think it's been a great discussion. Um, I promised at the outset that we had an all star panel and I think they delivered very insightful discussion this afternoon. And we certainly look forward to inviting each of you back with us again soon. Uh, to our audience, we welcome your feedback by email at rtp at regproject.org. Um, with that, thank you all for joining us and have a great day.